Well, hello, folks, and welcome to the Dieter Melhorn Fishing Podcast. I hope you're having a good day, whatever day it is that you happen to be listening to the show. If you're a regular listener, welcome back. Appreciate you joining it. And if you're new, uh, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for listening. If you are new, you may not know there is an audio version of this, which you may have found first, that is on all the popular podcast platforms. And there's a video version. I do these on my YouTube channel, Dieter Melhorn Fishing. Both the podcast and the YouTube channel are Dieter Melhorn Fishing, as is my guide business, as is my website, where you can reach out to me if you're listening to the podcast and want to give me some feedback, ideas, comments. It's where a lot of what I do comes from as far as ideas and content for the show. And it's where one of the things come from for one of the big topics we're going to talk about today. We'll get to that in a minute. DieterMelhornFishing.com. Go there. There's a contact section. You can reach out to me and, uh, yeah, hit me up with any comments that you got. Uh, we're going to hit on a few things today. A little recap of 2022 and just the fishing world, uh, my world, what's been going on. A little bit of talk about the tournament world, what's going on there. Uh, some stuff I'm going to try to do this year. And we're going to talk a little bit about the ACA. Hadn't heard much from them lately on my podcast, at least. They're still around. Uh, some state record fish. It's been interesting there. And the biggest thing, a big change to my channel. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. But first, 2022 summary, life is back to normal. Uh, it's the best way I know to describe it. It's uh, it, It's... I think the first full year where we haven't been dealing with any of the hangover from COVID, you know, 2020 crazy, who knows that all runs together in my mind, 2021, we still had a little bit of a hangover from it. This is the first year for me, at least totally back to normal. Uh, the, the, the guide business this year was great. Uh, you know, normal schedule there. Uh, the YouTube channel doing great podcast is too. Um, and then the production world with the video production stuff back to normal. The bad part is I've been extremely busy, good, bad. Uh, when you compare it to 2020 where there was nothing going on, it's a good thing. Um, so I'm happy where I'm at with that. Um, I've been busy. I've been all over the place and, uh, I appreciate you people sticking with me through all the chaos of everything. If you got to fish with me, I appreciate you coming by. I appreciate you checking it out. Uh, and coming fishing we had a good year we caught some good fish uh we had some tough days uh as always that's the one thing about being a fishing guide it is uh and i and i'm realistic with people it is not always what you see in the youtube video which is basically a highlight reel of a day of fishing uh so it's a you know it's 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 there's ups and downs good points and bad points and hey we roll with the punches and we try to stick with them and try to catch them and some days we do some days we don't catch as many, but anyway, um, speaking of catching them and not catching them, the tournament world had some interesting changes in 2022, and I think they're good ones, maybe, maybe bad ones, I don't know. Uh, part of that we're going to touch on, because uh, I want to throw it out there to get your opinion and your feedback on it uh, in the comment section uh, on YouTube or uh, by sending me an email uh, through my website. But, um, you know, one of the things was, and this kind of came over from, this has been longer than 2022, but what used to be the premier tournament in this country was called the Cabela's King Cat. Cabela's as in the chain of stores, King Cat. Uh, And it was a nationwide tournament series, or I I say a widespread tournament series. Um, and it culminated with a King Cat Classic that back when I fished tournaments, I fished several of them. Uh, that was kind of the pinnacle of the year. That was the Super Bowl in the tournament world. It's what everybody aspired to fish, what everybody aspired to win, to win this points championship, and then win the King Cat Cat Classic. Over the years, um, and the way this worked, the, the way this whole system worked, I'll just kind of summarize it here. It was a company that was basically had the Cabela's name attached to the tournament. It wasn't run by Cabela's itself. Cabela's was just a sponsor. And at the time, uh, the company was also doing a bunch of crappie fishing tournaments. So they knew how to hold tournaments. They knew how to promote them. They knew how to get money from travel and tourism bureaus to pay for them to be there. 
So that they were good at that. And they put on a series, and it was going good for many years, but it started to go downhill is the best way to summarize it for a lot of different reasons, which will be a whole nother podcast. Uh, but a lot of different things, higher entry fees, payout issues, issues with weigh-ins. It was a lot of, there was a lot of faith lost in the organization and, uh, they had a restructuring and we'll go into that in a whole nother podcast, but they're basically back with new leadership. And, uh, it's good leadership. Uh, it's looking like this series is going to be one that uh, may have some legs to go to the, uh, I ain't going to say the next level, but to, con- to to actually carry out a nationwide series. That's one thing that we've, they were the only ones to ever do it. Uh, the Cabela's was, the Cabela King Cat was the only one that ever was somewhat nationwide. Uh, the new trend that we'll get into in, in the whole tournament world has been these high entry fee, high payout tournaments, uh, you know, normal, you know, I say normal, the, the, the used to be the format was anywhere from 75 to $200 to enter a tournament. And, you know, it was a decent payout, but as more and more pe- people want the sensation of a big payout, they want to be able to advertise a tournament that's going to pay 10, 20, 30, $40,000 to the winner. It's sensational. It looks great. And the only way to do that is to get significantly higher entry fees from the people entering the tournament. Because all catfish tournaments, the money that you win is pulled together from the people fishing the tournament. It's like playing poker. I've equated this to gambling before because really that's all it is. Everybody who's in the game, just like a hand of poker, puts money into the pot. And then it's paid back out to the winner, the top three, the top five, seldom more than the top five, which is another issue that I'll get to in a second with some of this. But the whole point being, if you're going to limit, if you want to pay out $50,000 to the winner and you're only going to allow 100 boats, because a lot of these tournaments don't want a lot of people getting in there uh, because they don't want somebody just getting lucky and winning. They'd rather have it among competitive people as odd as that thought process is there's a reason for it but if you're going to do that you have to have a pretty high entry fee to make that work so that's kind of the new little trend um, is raising the entry fee on these tournaments limited to the number of boats was honestly too there's a pain in the butt with having two or three hundred boats in a tournament logistically it's a nightmare it's a nightmare for the tournament organizers. Uh, it's a nightmare when it comes to trying to do a weigh-in. Uh, it, it's it's a nightmare for lodging and and just the going through the weigh-in process. And uh, it's it's not a good thing. Limited in it, kind of get you kind of got these shifting little scales here of you know entry fees has to go up, limit the number of boats a lot more manageable. Not to mention you can put it online a lot easier. Trying to show a weigh-in. Uh, the ACA tried doing this with some tournaments, and they were, you know some other people tried doing them. Uh, I think it was the Bama Blues and stuff, Winter Blues, that kind of stuff. And these weigh-ins, if you want people to watch them and be focused on them to be you know there to see your sponsors, they have to be fairly concise. And uh, when you've got that many boats to weigh in, they never are. So there's some advantages to doing all this stuff, is what I'm getting at. But that's kind of the new trend. Um, it'll be interesting to see um, how it evolves. I would love to see it evolve to where, because right now, like I said, this is a a, a gambler's game. Um, and what I mean by that is professional bass fishermen pay, you know, $2,500, $5,000 to enter a tournament. The difference is with the structure of the way they do things it pays out way further down the field than just the top five or top eight, top 10, whatever. Reason for that is professional bass anglers. That word right there, professionals. These guys are making a living as professional fishermen. So you don't make a living as a professional gambler unless you can do it every day and you can't do this every day uh these high-end tournaments there's just not that many of them so my whole point is if we're if the catfish world's ever going to get to the point to where we have professional anglers people making a living doing it and i think that's 
long ways off, guys. Don't get me wrong. I think that's a long way down the road. I don't see it in the foreseeable future in the catfish world. It's going to have to get to the point where the payout's going to have to trickle further down the field. Right now, I think we like the sensation of a huge payout, and you're only paying out a few people versus, you know, paying out a good amount of money, but it pays further down the field so that somebody that comes in 15th or 20th can actually – consider doing this at a professional level uh the question i brought up on some of these tournaments is just how often will you fill a field at five thousand dollars per person to enter it you can do that once a year there'll be people that'll gamble on it will they do it every week will they do it 10 times a year will they do it eight times a year i don't know that's a conversation that i'm planning to have with some people this year and uh go over some of that stuff so yeah great to hear that king cat is getting their stuff together. I'm going to try to get up with them. If anybody out there is listening, knows the people, the new managers of King Cat, I'm going to get them up here. I know Scott Peavy, uh, a guy who is local, is working with them on some stuff. So I think he can get me hooked up to the right people. But I would love to chat with them and just hear about what they got going on uh, in, in the future. So obviously there was a cheating scandal this year in the walleye world. That was um, sensational for the entire fishing world. Uh, I don't fish for walleye. I don't know much about that world. But anybody outside of the fishing world that knows that I fish, and a lot of them do, they would comment about that because it transcended the fishing community. This made it to, you know, the nightly news. Uh, TMZ was reporting. Listen, when TMZ reports on something in the fishing world, it's big. And that scandal, uh, good, bad whatever bad for the sport i don't know i mean something like something that kind of negativity is is not a positive light but it did shed some light on just the possibilities of cheating and cheating in the catfish world i did a podcast on it and yes i think cheating can happen i think it does happen i do not think it is widespread though uh i, I think most of the people that are cheating are not doing it for the money they're doing it for notoriety and they're doing it for the look at me effect. And a lot of times in a lot of these situations where people have been caught cheating, uh, they had plenty of money. So it's usually not about the money. It's about look at me. They want that pat on the back. So I don't think there's, I don't think it happens that often, but, and I don't think in the catfish world, it's going to happen with people stuffing ways. There's some other ways that people cheat and, I think, um, I think if anything, the scandal has shed some light on that and probably made us uh, maybe be a little bit tighter with how we do things in a tournament world. So, yeah, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what the, those guys were charged. They were criminally charged. When you try to fraud somebody out of that much money to fraud somebody, uh, yeah, it becomes a criminal event. And, uh, yeah, it's going to uh, – their life will be forever changed because of that, as it should be. So, uh, the ACA, American Catfishing Association, haven't talked much about them lately. Um, they, um, you know, as, as since the beginning, they've been heavily focused on the tournament world. And uh, that's pretty much their bread and butter. That's where they make their money at. That's what's keeping the boat afloat and keeping the operation going. Um, and uh, they've been heavily involved in that. With that said, uh, they have been putting some stuff together, reaching out. And trying to formulate some things uh, with some conservation er efforts in some states that are kind of in critical need. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. Not every state needs a whole lot of conservation like effort from them right now. I think their resources are limited in what they can do. Uh, and, you know, probably being smart in that what energy they have, what money they have, they're putting into the places where the most critical need is. North Carolina, honestly, um, you know, we're in pretty good shape here. Uh, we, we've got a group of people, myself included, who kind of will handle that, uh, spearhead that. Now, you know, if something happens that's a critical change, uh, we'll reach out to them and try to get the nationwide support. But the uh, I, I'm glad to see that they're putting some taking some steps uh, to, you know, make some positive moves there in that direction with conservation. And I'm going to try getting them on the show this year, uh, talk to Glenn and uh, kind of get a candid conversation with him, talking about the organization. I know some of you are members, some of you are not, some of you are on the fence, and, you know, that's your decision on whether you join or not. 
Uh, I, as I've said in some other podcasts, um, I think it's our last shot in my lifetime of having a nationwide organization. And I know that's pretty, that's pretty fatalistic, but I think if this one doesn't work, you won't see a national catfishing organization happen. Um, what they put into place, the effort they put into it, you're not going to get anybody else to do. So if you so feel you would like to join and support it, then uh, I, 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 I think you could spend your money uh, in worse places is the best way to put it. So we'll move on from that. Look for a podcast with Glenn this year. Um, The one thing about conservation, there are some states that don't need it, uh, as I was saying earlier. And I'll tell you, with the state records that were broken this year, and I came up with six of them. I believe there are six state records for catfish that have been broken. Something's going right. Either A... The amount of fish we have out there and the uh, trophy fish are either A, being recognized, uh, more people are fishing for them, or our catch and release efforts are working. I think it's a little bit of all of the above. I think the people who are fishing for big catfish now are, uh, the majority of them are catch and release oriented. And honestly, I've said this before. State record fish, state record catfish is one of the few fish that will be released alive after it's weighed in. You don't see that with bluegill. You don't see that with bass. You don't see it with many other fish. Most fish go to the biologist and the certified scale in a cooler dead. So the fact that a lot of these fish, and not all of them, not all of them, there's, there were some fish that were caught and killed this year. Uh, and that's going to happen. And if it's legal, then so be it. But uh, but six fish is what I come up with. The, the biggest one was the Mississippi record, uh, which I believe was 131 pounds. I did a video on it. Can't even remember how much it was. Um, that was a massive fish. Uh, it was, uh, which kind of surprises me. I, I believe it was 131. I want to make sure that's right. Uh, go check that, uh, uh, fact checkers. But there was another one called that was on a limb line or a trot line. Uh, they recognized those non sporty means records down there, which is a big fish too. That's great that they caught it. I uh, don't know if it was released alive or not, but yeah, Mississippi new state record for blue catfish. Um, South Dakota had a new record for a flathead catfish, 67 pounds. Um, 67 is a, Good fish. I'm not sure what the previous record is. South Dakota, they've got a relatively short growing season up there because it gets so cold. So, you know, flatheads, they they generally don't get to those epic proportions. Uh, 67 pounds, good fish. It just goes to show you that nationwide flatheads just don't get as big as the blue cats do. The world record, 123 pounds, was a true anomaly when it comes to a flathead catfish and the perfect circumstances to get one. But yeah, South Dakota, Tennessee, Micah Burkhart, 118 pounder out there. I'm amazed Tennessee doesn't have a bigger state record than that. Uh, but we kind of got jaded the past 10 years with, you know, some of the fish coming out of North Carolina, Virginia, repeated fish over 130 pounds out of Virginia. We kind of got jaded, but 118 pounds finally broke that record out there in Tennessee. And then again with that Mississippi blue, the interesting state, the most interesting state of all, West Virginia. And if I got this right, three state record catfish out of Virginia in one year. First was a channel catfish, amazing channel catfish. I would, I would die to catch a catfish this big. Almost 37 pounds, 36.96 pounds. Alan Barquette is the name I've got on it. South Mill Creek Lake. What do you catch it on? Oh, gotta have a drink of coffee for this. What did he catch it on? Dun, 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 dun. By his account, chicken liver. Believe it or not, chicken liver. Um, so there you go. That old chicken producing another record fish. Hey, the world record catfish was caught on chicken. So there you go. Um, but yeah, it's a, so West Virginia got a channel cat record. Then in March, April, I'm sorry, April, Cody Carver. Breaks the blue catfish record at a Kanara River, 61.28 pound fish. 
uh, released alive, by the way. There's a great video of it. Kept it alive. Got it released alive. Great fish. Cody's got a state record out of West Virginia. Until about seven weeks later, Steve Price, same river, Kanawha River, 67.22 pounds. So the state record for blue is broken and then broken again uh, twice in the same year. So I've got six of them. I'm trying to think if I overlooked any smaller ones anywhere else in the country. You know, the previous couple of years, uh, you know, we had had the flathead broken in North Carolina, blue broken in North Carolina, Georgia got a new record. So these records are getting beat all over the place. And I think it goes to show that the there's more people fishing. The fishing's good. More people are pursuing them. People are, have the gear and the tackle to catch them now. Uh, no more of those, you know, giant fish broke off because you don't have the right tackle. And people are doing a good job of keeping these things alive, at least trying to keep them alive. And I commend you guys for doing that. That's uh, amazing. Uh, we It's one thing we can say. We may be a bunch of, you know, rednecks out here fishing for catfish, but we put up a better effort to keep those fish alive than anybody else out there. So I commend you guys for doing it. Uh, the last thing I'll touch on uh, is some changes to my channel. I've uh, been doing this for a while now, and uh, it's been a good ride. I've enjoyed it, and uh, things are good. I, you know, no complaints. Trying to get better and better with everything I'm doing. Um, but I've gotten some requests from people for some different stuff, and... Um, uh, what I'm going to end up doing, uh, some of the stuff that they want is not really good content for the channel. And that all comes down to the algorithm. It also comes down to how much time I can invest in it to get it up on the channel for basically no worth or no views. But there is some stuff that people want. Uh, and there's some access that people want. So I decided to do channel memberships. I've been kicking this around. I put off Patreon for years because I had to come up with a way. And I've said this all along. I've got to devout, develop some kind of value for it. Some people will put up a channel membership and say, hey, just join, and I appreciate it. A lot of channels do that, and that's great. There is a level of my channel where that's basically where it's at, uh, you know, a very low entry level. You're supporting the channel. You're saying, thank you, Dieter, for doing this. Here's some extra money for keeping it up and putting the stuff out. But for the upper level stuff, I needed some kind of value. So I came up with some different levels. Uh, and y'all can go take a look at it, see if it's something that you're interested in, see if it benefits you. There's some benefits there for some people, uh, you know, at different levels. I even did some stupid high-end ones just for the heck of it. I don't really expect anybody to join them, but uh, I decided to do it for the heck of it. So uh, the biggest thing with some of those lower three levels, there's some real benefit there, especially the with some of the stuff there with some of the private phone calls, consultations, that kind of stuff. Because I'm getting more and more people that are reaching out that want me to analyze their lake, look at where they're fishing. And it's harder and harder to do that. Um, you know, the size of the channel is one thing I said. As the channel grows, it gets bigger. It's harder and harder to have that personal connection with everybody. And uh, while I can do that, I can sit down and spend some time looking. You know, that's going to tie up an hour, uh, a solid hour to do that, to look at a specific area for a specific time of the year. So I worked something out in some packages. There may be a handful of people want to do that. And if so, great. I think it'll be interesting to do it. And uh, who knows, we may feature some of them in some videos. But by the time this podcast goes up, all of that stuff should be up and active. And uh, you can check it out and see if it's something you're interested in. If you're not, if you don't join, uh, you're not a member of the channel, nothing's going to change. The YouTube channel, you really won't know there's much of a difference, to be perfectly honest, except there'll be a join button on the uh, screen. So um, the podcasts are staying the same. Uh, live streams, which I haven't done a lot of them, are staying the same. Some of the live streams I'm going to do at one of the membership levels so we have time to answer questions. That was one of the things I really found out the last time I did a podcast or a live stream, the last couple of live streams. You get so many people in there and it's hard to keep up with all the questions. Uh, there's going to be a level where I'm going to do some private uh, members only uh, live streams to where it will give those people time to answer questions and, um, you know, there, so there won't be as many people in the live streams. 
and you know they won't have to put up a super chat money to get their you know thing recognized i'll be able to you know we may have five or ten people in there so it'll be a lot easier to answer questions directly a lot easier to get some one-on-one -on -one. so that was some of the value that i came up with doing that but yeah keep an eye out for that but as far as the channel videos are going to stay the same uh the shorts are going to stay the same some of y'all love them some of you hate them uh, i'm still playing around with them uh, but yeah, everything is going to be the same on the channel. You really won't notice any change. It's just a little different value for, or added some added value for some people at a different level as far as what they want and stuff. So it's, uh, going to be interesting. It's going to be a challenging year. Uh, going to be a challenging year for me trying to get more and more podcasts. I've got a list of people, um, that I'm going to try doing podcasts with because I believe the podcasts with people are way more interesting. It's just hard to get it coordinated, but I've got like four in the burner for the first week and we'll try to crank those out. And I think I am going to continue to upload the videos to YouTube. Um, I think enough people watch them, enough people are interested in them. And uh, so, yeah, we'll stick with that. But that's it for now, guys. Uh, goodbye to 2022. And hello to 2023. I hope it's a good one. I hope y'all stay healthy. And uh, we'll catch you out on the water.